I think we're ready. Okay, we'll go ahead and start the webinar. Okay, well, okay. Okay, um, good evening, everybody. Thank you um, for um, taking the time uh, on a Wednesday evening to uh, come to the uh, facial pain webinar. This is gonna be facial pain uh, 101, an overview and understanding of trigeminal neuralgia. It's gonna be some case presentations uh, as well as a panel discussion. So um, first I wanna thank um, the Facial Pain Association. They're our, our partner in this and co-sponsored this webinar. Uh, their, uh, um, their webpage is www.facepain.org and they're available for any kind of patient support related issues. Uh, so feel free to contact them. You can see their phone number and their uh, webpage there. I do wanna point out there will be a Facial Pain Association virtual conference um, in January and um, on January 29th and 30th, uh, 2022. Um, this, uh, you can register for this conference on the uh, Facial Pain Association uh, website. This uh, will have a variety of um, experts in uh, facial pain and trigeminal neuralgia um, speaking at that, um, at that conference. Uh, so with us tonight, um, we have a very distinguished panel from the Departments of Neurosurgery, Neurology, Radiation Oncology, Anesthesia, and Neuroradiology. I do want to introduce um, the uh, panelists um, uh, before we get into the talk. Uh, so this is uh, these are our four world experts uh, in uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, Yushin uh, Zhang is um, a, a neurologist um, expert in medical management of trigeminal neuralgia. Um, also um, um, treats a lot of patients with headaches. Um, so she she's often one of the first um, uh, frontline physicians that sees um, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, Dr. Pollum is a radiation oncologist and um, one of my partners when we treat trigeminal neuralgia with uh, CyberKnife radiosurgery. Um, Max uh, Wintermark is uh, um, the division chief of neuroradiology here um, at, at Stanford and um, a phenomenal expert in reading out MRI scans. He's the, he's the guy that all of us call when, when we need um, somebody uh, with, uh, to take a look at some MRI scans with us. And uh, Dr. Chen is a, a world-class leader in, in pain management, um, both in terms of uh, medical management and in some, some tr um, procedural treatments for trigeminal neuralgia that, that we'll cover. So the format of this webinar um, is going to uh, be as follows. I'm gonna give a quick brief overview of trigeminal neuralgia and the basic treatment options. We're gonna review some MRI imaging and pick on Dr. Wintermark. Uh, for that. Um, and then I'm going to present a series of cases to our, our distinguished panel to ask them for comments on how they would manage the particular um, case that um, I presented to them. And then we'll have some time uh, for um, a question and answer session. So very briefly, trigeminal neuralgia described as one of the most excruciating uh, types of pain. And, and uh, when it was in, in the 1700s, it was described as a suicide disease because at that point, we didn't know how to manage it, and it it, it really, um, you know, was was uh, uh, you know was a significant um, issue for the patients that did have it. It's estimated to affect one in about eight thousand people per year, um, usually over the age of fifty, although not not always. Uh, and women have a higher incidence um, than than men of having trigeminal neuralgia. In most cases, the pain is caused by a blood vessel pushing on the nerve, and I'll show you some pictures um, and a video of that. It can often be misdiagnosed uh, as either tooth pain or uh, jaw pain or some other type of pain, and, and many patients often see multiple physicians before achieving the, the correct diagnosis. And in 10% of the patients, it's bilateral. So I put this slide in here because most of the time and many of the, I think the, the webinar participants probably have, have had this experience where you go to the doctor and you kind of try to explain the symptoms and it, um, it's hard sometimes to describe. And most of the time uh, the, the physician may not, if they're, particularly if they're not an expert in trigeminal neuralgia, they may not even know what it is or how to make a diagnosis. And if they don't know what it is or how to make a diagnosis, they can't um, get you to uh, the right doctors to help manage the pain. Um, this is the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. Um, there's three branches. Um, I like to think of it as forehead, cheek, and chin. Um, and so when you come in with describing trigeminal neuralgia, we will we'll try to elucidate which one of these branches is involved, and it can be more than one branch. 
So usually the lower two branches, V2 and V3 are the most common. Uh, we talked about how trigeminal neuralgia is usually one-sided, but, but can be bilateral. Um, as these are important triggers. So chewing, talking, brushing your teeth, washing your face, um, yawning, uh, all tend to trigger trigeminal neuralgia uh, type of pain. And, and it's common for patients to have periods of remission and they can range from days to, to months. Um, I've had some patients come in, all, they're all ready for their procedure and you know, a week before the procedure, the pain disappears. And sometimes that can, can persist for a long period of time. The, um, the pain characteristics are sharp electrical shock-like pain uh, attacks. Um, the pain is, is described as stabbing, very intense, sharp, and it's usually precipitated by uh, uh, trigger areas or trigger factors. Uh, the, the patients usually have a very stereotypical type of, of pain pattern that is, is usually um, repeats in terms of its uh, type and format for that individual uh, patient. And we'll show you some pictures about how blood vessels pushing on the nerve are the most common cause. So Max, Dr. Winnemark, you're, you're up. So head CT scans, um, what's the utility of head CT scans in terms of, of diagnosing trigeminal neuralgia? So we use, so the, the two main diagnostic tests that we use are CAT scan and MRIs. Uh, CAT scans uh, are good to look at bones. Uh, they're also very good to look at blood vessels. Um, they are a little less good than MRI to look at the trigeminal nerve itself, but still you can see it. And often the head CT can be a, a first step to try to see if there's something else that may be contributing to the pain because part of the, you know, what you mentioned earlier, Steve, is the diagnosis is difficult. There are many different conditions that can mimic this one. And so part of the diagnostic workup is also to exclude other causes. And that's something that we can do on CT. Uh, on CT also, as you pointed out earlier, you can see, for instance, here, one of the trigeminal nerves. So one thing to know when you look at medical images is we always look at the images like if we were facing the patient lying down and we're looking at the patient from the, their feet side. And so, so the left yeah, part so of the is image the... is actually their right side and the this right the part right of the image is actually their left side. So here you were pointing at the left trigeminal nerve that we, we can see uh, originating from that part of the brain that we call the pons and heading towards the Meckel scale. Okay. So you mentioned MRI scans. So um, let, let's, let's talk about, and this is an MRI scan. And um, very, just really quickly, I'll show the, the, the webinar attendees. This is the right trigeminal nerve here. And this is the left trigeminal nerve here. And some of these little tiny lines are blood vessels. So Max, tell us about the utility of MRI scans for diagnosing trigeminal neuralgia. So as you can see, an MRI looks very different from a CAT scan, you know, in terms of appearance. And also as you can easily see is that the resolution, the, the type of details that we're able to see on an MRI is a lot more than what you can see on a head CT. And you, you can, you know, before you could kind of guess where the trigeminal nerve was based on uh, Steve pointing uh, the pointer in the appropriate direction, whereas here you, you clearly see those trigeminal nerves uh, and their course. And also, as Steve mentioned, kind of the other big advantage is you can clearly see also uh, those other squiggly structure that come close, sometimes push on the trigeminal nerve uh, that are the, those uh, blood vessels. And typically from where they are located, where they come from, we can identify whether they are arteries or vein, and we can usually tell what, what artery it is that's pump pressing against the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so Max, two quick questions. Um, can you see um, if there's more than one bl blood vessel touching the nerve, is the MRI um, able to tell us that? And second question is, can you tell the difference on an MRI scan between an artery and a vein? Yes. So the answer to the first question, yes, we can tell the difference between an artery and a vein because we can track those vessels and see where they, they start and where they finish. And so that helps us differentiating an artery from a vein. Um, the, the, there can be at times more than one vessel 
uh, getting close to the trigeminal nerve. And that's also one thing that's very nice under my, we all have blood vessels. We all have blood vessels coursing relatively close to the trigeminal nerve. But sometimes some of those vessels come too close, can press on the trigeminal nerve. And so MRI is quite good at differentiating normal blood vessels who are just coursing in the vicinity of the trigeminal nerve versus uh, one of those blood vessels is really pushing uh, on the trigeminal nerve. And, and again, as you are showing here, we, when we look at MRI images, we can look at them in different plane before we saw uh, an image where uh, we were going through the brain in that direction. Here's a, an, a separate MRI images where we go through the brain in that different direction. And that can also show us quite well the trigeminal nerves here on each side, those dots on each side of, again, that brain structure called the pons. Mm -hmm. and again, similarly, you can see around the trigeminal nerve, you can see those squiggly structures that corresponds to those blood vessels. And finally, here's the last direction uh, that you can look at the brain. And so really, as you can see, we have almost a, a three-dimensional view at those trigeminal nerve. And we can really figure out whether the blood vessel courses under the trigeminal nerve or over it, and whether it's push, just coursing next to it or pushing against it. Okay, so we, we use MRI scans, as, as Dr. Winnemark said. I just want to make one, one uh, ask you one more question. Uh, um, Dr. Winnemark. Um, so um, we, we talked about how blood vessels are often touching a nerve. Um, in, in patients without trigeminal neuralgia, how often do you see the blood vessels touching the nerves? Uh, it's, so it's not an absolute science. So some, you, you know, I would say that when we always see blood vessels coursing close to the trigeminal nerve in every single patient, um, in patients who have trigeminal neuralgia, we're more likely to see those blood vessels pushing against the trigeminal nerve. But of course, at the end of the day, it's not just about the imaging, it's also about the clinical evaluation and about putting all those elements together to come up with the, the diagnosis. So uh, our role on the imaging side is to provide this piece of information that you display here, you know, uh, you know how many vessels uh, are coursing close to the trigeminal nerve? Are they arteries or vein? What's their size? Are they pressing on the trigeminal nerve or not? In which portion of the trigeminal nerve they are they are pressing on? And and then basically that helps you, all of you on the panel. Then when it comes time to to make a, a diagnosis and and then to decide the best uh, approach for treatment. Great, Thank, thanks, Dr. Winmark. So this is an MRI scan where we see the left trigeminal nerve with a single blood vessel. Mm -hmm. And um, you can kind of, as we scroll through the different slices here, we can see the blood vessel crossing the nerve um, there. Um, this is a, another MRI sequence where there's actually two blood vessels. Two blood vessels, the, yes. Right trigeminal nerve. And looks like there's one even on the left side here. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of different variation in anatomy. and. Uh, Max, what's this here? So that's a, a big artery in the brain. It's called the basilar artery. Usually it's straight on the midline, on the, the middle of our brain. But is, as you can see here, it's kind of looping to the side. And by looping to the side, it gets, if you scroll a little bit up, it basically bumps into the trigeminal nerve and, um, you know, compresses it. And so, so again, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you have those uh, variants in terms of the the course and the size of the, the blood vessels that we uh, see in every single patient, but sometimes they are looping like what we see here. Okay, great, Dr. Winnemark. Two more, two more little pictures and I'm gonna let you take a break, okay? <laughs> okay, so this patient has trigeminal neuralgia, but what do you see here? So this patient, as you can see, so that's what I was telling you earlier. Uh, you know, one goal of the imaging is to look at the trigeminal nerve and whether there are vessels coursing close to the right or the left trigeminal nerve. But sometimes you have also other findings that may or may not be related to the symptoms that the patient is presenting. And here, what you can see is what is uh, pointed by Dr. Chang. Uh, it's an enhancing, it's a lesion that basically takes up some of the dye that we inject for that particular MRI. And it's a type of brain tumor called an acoustic neuroma. And, and, uh, and again, 
you know, whether that contributes or not to the symptoms, probably because as you can see here, it's coming very close to the, the trigeminal nerve on the other side, this time from the outside. And it looks like it's pressing a little bit on the origin of the trigeminal nerve from the outside. Yeah, exactly. It's pushing on the nerve uh, right here. Here's the, the tumor and it's indenting the nerve. Um, well, this. And this here it's a different type of uh, brain tumor. So again, you know, we have seen cases where it's just one or two blood vessels that are pressing on the nerve. We have seen uh, a first type of brain tumor called a, a neuro, an acoustic neuroma pressing on the trigeminal nerve. It's a different type of brain tumor. Again, we see that that dye that is being sucked up by that lesion called the meningioma. Uh, and basically that lesion, again, uh, you know, grows close to the pons and as a result compresses the trigeminal nerve again on the right side of the patient, which is actually the left side of the image. Right. Okay. A um, couple more. So this patient um, has um, cancer and there is a little dot I don't know if you guys can see there's a little white dot on the trigeminal nerve. So, so, so sometimes ahead. what can happen is when the, the cancer disseminates uh, to other regions of the body, sometimes uh, a patient can be unfortunate and one of the area of dissemination can be right on top of the trigeminal nerve. And so in that case, it's not uh, a vessel compressing the nerve or tumor that's coming close. It's really a small implant of that disseminated tumor, what we call a metastasis uh, that develops right in within the, the trigeminal nerve on the right side, again, of the patient, left side of the image in this particular patient. Okay, great. Um, so I think the point um, I was trying to make with, with uh, these um, slides is um, an MRI scan is useful to rule out kind of atypical or less common causes of trigeminal neuralgia, um, such as, um, you know, those, those types of tumors. Um, that, that's uncommon. Most of the time we see a blood vessel, but even when we get the scans that show a blood vessel, it does tell us if there is, um, you know, one blood vessel, two blood vessels, large ones, arteries, veins, that are all very, very helpful. So let's talk a little bit about vascular compression. Um, it's, there's a large variation in anatomy as we've seen. It's very common for blood vessels and nerves to be touching one another inside the skull. And you know, the, the majority of time uh, when we see a patient with um, a blood vessel touching a nerve, um, they don't have trigeminal neuralgia. The MRIs are done for you know, other reasons, headaches, or maybe there was some sort of instance of head trauma. And you can see blood vessels touching the nerve in many of these patients as well. So just because you have a blood vessel touching the nerve doesn't mean that you're going to have um, trigeminal neuralgia. But in some cases, the interaction of the blood vessel and the nerves causes the nerves to become irritated or even injured. And this may be because of direct pressure uh, of the nerve, um, uh, or it may be from arterial pulsation, kind of a, 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 a banging of the uh, artery on the nerve each time your heart beats. And the injured nerve gives the brain the perception of being stimulated, and, and the stimulation is interpreted by the brain as, as pain. So in this picture here, we see kind of a little cartoon of an artery indenting the nerve. The nerve has um, this um, outer coating called Schwann cells that demonstrate as these black um, marks here. And you can see where the artery compresses the nerve, you see a breakdown in, in the tissue there. So that, that's, that's essentially what's going on when the artery injures the, the nerve. So this is another picture. This um, uh, uh, shows the uh, nerve, the trigeminal nerve here as in yellow, and we see an indentation of the, the artery pushing on the nerve. Uh, here's actually a photo, interoperative photo, that shows the trigeminal nerve here. Um, and you can see a blood vessel is just indenting the nerve. It's kind of almost like putting a little kink in the nerve there. Um, and each time this vessel pulsates, um, the nerve is injured and that uh, causes the trigeminal neuralgia pain. You can also see this is a classic example where there's more than one blood vessel touching the nerve. There's a blood vessel on, on this side. Uh, touching the nerve here as well. So this 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 poor trigeminal nerve is sandwiched between two two blood vessels, one on the right and one on the left, and both of them are banging up against the nerve each time the heart beats. There. So I want to show one um, video um, that um, talks about um, uh, the the, um, the the way that we manage um, the 
the um, trigeminal nerve. So in this video here, um, this is the trigeminal nerve right here. Um, it, was, it was compressed by two blood vessels. There was one blood vessel on, on the uh, right side here, and you can see this white cushion is a Teflon pledget that we put in place. And you can see this is the blood vessel right here. Um, so the cushion is cushioning the blood vessel from the nerve. On this side, you actually see another blood vessel right here, coursing right here, and here's the nerve. We've, we've separated some other arachnoid adhesions that um, um, usually bind the blood vessel to the nerve, and we've created a little, little of a gap there. And in that gap, we're gonna put a, uh, another cushion. So you'll see us um, um, uh, lowering a cushion in there. These, these are, they're, they're made out of Teflon. They're called Teflon pledgets. Um, I think um, most people don't think of Teflon as looking like this, but it, it, and this is the way it looks in, in medical devices. Um, in the medical world. So what we're going to do is we, we put the cushion uh, where we approximately where we want it to be. And then using a series of micro instruments, we will tuck the cushion in the space between the, um, uh, the blood vessel and the, the nerve. Um, so we, we have to do it very gently. You see, that's a vein. That's a big vein there. We don't want to injure that vein. So you have to work between um, these uh, other delicate structures in there. And so we're, we're tucking that cushion in between the blood vessel and, and the nerve. Um, and uh, this is what, uh, what we call microvascular decompression. Okay. So that's uh, one treatment is a microvascular decompression. Another treatment option that Dr. Uh, Pollum specializes in is, is um, what's called stereotactic radiosurgery. It's a way that we use focused radiation to essentially zap the, the, the nerve. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that. But um, this is the, the type of machine with, that we use. We're able to generate a computer plan to generate um, um, a way to, to precisely deliver the radiation to the nerve. In general, um, it provides um, overall um, excellent results, both in the short term and long term. And some people want to know why there's a drop off in um, this um, results. It turns out that when you injure the nerve with radiation to eliminate the, the pain fibers, the nerve doesn't know that the injury is done for a good reason. And so it actually tries to heal. And if it can heal, then the pain fibers can get going again. And that's why there's a, there's a, there's a drop off um, in, the, in the longer run for something like this. Um, this is what a treatment plan looks like. Um, so these are the same MRI scans that I showed in the beginning. And you can see these um, concentric colored circles are the radiation doses that uh, Dr. Pollan has planned um, on um, to deliver the radiation to the nerve. And then um, last um, treatment option we're going to talk about before we go to the case presentation. This is something um, that Dr. Chen specializes in. It's called a rhizotomy. Um, and essentially, um, he's able to introduce a needle in the cheek up to where the trigeminal nerve is. And then using heat is able to um, uh, create a lesion, injure the pain fibers so they no longer conduct pain. And that allows um, patients to have um, a pain, pain relief. So it's another kind of schematic of how we do this. Okay, so that's the brief overview of what trigeminal neurology is and what the different treatment options are. So I'm gonna go, go into the, the panel discussion now. And in, in this case, I, uh, to remind the, the people, the participants on the, the webinar, I'm going to present a series of basic cases um, to the panelists and uh, we'll um, ask various panelists to comment on how they would manage this uh, particular case. Um, many of these cases is more than one um, or even two different options here. So um, I think in the, in, for the panelists, I think if there's um, more than one option that you would consider, you can, you can briefly mention both. Um, but in the interest of time, if you could um, just be very concise with, with your comments. So again, Dr. Zhang from Neurology, Dr. Palm from Radiation Oncology, Dr. Wintermark from Neuroradiology, and Dr. Chen from the Ping Service. Okay, so here's the, the first case. This is a young patient um, who um, has not had um, um, uh, any long-standing history of uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and in this particular patient, um, no prior medications have been given so far and the pain onset is, is new. So um, Dr. Zhang, let me start with you. So this patient 
is probably the type of patient that would end up in your clinic um, first before seeing any of the rest of us. So what were your comments beyond this? And I should say the MRI scan does show a vascular loop pushing on the blood vessel. Right, right. Thanks, Steve. So this is a very common case that we'll see. And usually we're in a first line or second line after they've seen a general neurologist and someone who's never tried anything. And if their symptoms are consistent with trigeminal neuralgia, I typically go for oxcarbazepine. So I think about, you know, the big three, which is carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and lamotrigine. And if they haven't tried any of those, I usually start with oxcarb, um, good evidence and um, less side effects than carbamazepine. Okay. And, and, um, uh, how, how long would you give the medication um, to work and what's kind of the overall percentage of success rate you've seen in, in something like this? Yeah, so for oxarbazepine and for many of these trigeminal neuralgia medicines, if they are effective, you see the benefit within days. So usually within a week or so, you can see, you know, if it's working or not. And sometimes you have to titrate it up to a certain dose before you see um, benefit. Um, in our patients, you know, each individual really varies. Um, when it works, it works really well. I would say most of the people who try oxcarbazepine find some sort of benefit. Ultimately, depends on if they can tolerate the side effects. Okay. Um, so two questions. Um, one is, let's say this uh, this patient takes the the medication that you prescribe and has has amazing reduction in pain. Yeah. And, you know, pain's completely gone, super happy. Um, how, how long typically does, do the, med do the medicines work? Do they work forever? Do they fail at some point? What's been your experience? In, in, in my experience, they continue to work over time, actually. Um, okay. You know, some, for some individuals, it does, they start to have breakthrough pain. And sometimes we need to add on adjunctive therapies. And also that's when I start to think about, should we be referring to Dr. Chang to, you know, look at whether surgery is an option if they're failing many medicines. Great. And you mentioned um, one of your comments, like if they can tolerate the side effects of the yeah. medication. So what would be some of the, the main side effects that um, a patient would see from something like this? Absolutely. So for carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, I'd say drowsiness um, is a big side effect, dizziness as well. Some people get ataxia, which is difficulty with walking. Um, and then you have to be careful with our blood counts. Sometimes it can reduce blood counts and cause low sodium or hyponatremia. Great. Thank you. Dr. Chen, I know you, uh, um, in addition to doing procedures, you also um, help manage patients with medication. So what would be your, your approach to this, um, you know, 31 year old young, young guy, super healthy, you know, pain just started a week ago and, um, but he does have the, the compression on the MRI scan. What would, what would your approach be? Well, I, I you know, first of all, I conquered Dr. Uh, Zhang's uh, uh, approach towards this patient. Uh, I will offer the options uh, of medical management versus, you know, surgical decompression to the patient. Uh, I'll let the patient select, uh, you know, um, that whether this is something that patient, you know, would like to go forward uh, to address underlying problem versus, yes, I think there is a likelihood that the medications would be helpful uh, for you. Um, but I think with a young age and also uh, with MI positive for vascular compression, I'm leaning towards a referral to the surgical colleague. But I definitely would offer, uh, you know, a patient both options, medical management uh, versus surgical options. I think either way is is appropriate. Okay. So for for both of, of you, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Chen, how how many different types of medications would would you say is reasonable to try before you consider the patient to fail medical management with medications? Dr. Zhang. Yeah, happy to go first. Um, uh, typically, if they fail the oxcarbazepine, I often will have them try the carbamazepine. And then, you know, depending on how, you know, reluctant or enthusiastic they are uh, for surgery, for a surgical option, if they're not enthusiastic about that, I will go on to lamotrigine. And sometimes combination treatment, like adding on gabapentin, adding on baclofen on top, you know, one of the three can be very helpful. Okay. Dr. Chen? Yeah, I kind of. How many agree. different medications are worth trying? 
Yeah, I, I would say two or three different kinds of uh, you know neuromodulation agent uh, that you know if they if they don't work or, or uh, you know not as ideal, then I, I consider that okay. We've tried it. Okay, um, Doctor Doctor Pollum. Um, so if if this patient, let's say, saw you first, um, came to your clinic, um, would you? you know, recommend trying the medications first or what, what would your, what's your thoughts on this case? Yeah, this is a young guy. Um, and if the medications were working that, you know, that that's probably what I would try first. Um, and definitely uh, refer to, um, a surgeon to talk about, um, you know, uh, local, uh, treatment, um, okay. before discussing radio surgery. Okay. Okay. So let's, um, switch it up a little bit. Um, so uh, this is a second case. He's a 55 year old male. Um, he's, he's had pain for two years. So it's not, not brand new. It's two years. He, he failed Tegretol and Gabapentin. So Dr. Chien and Dr. Zhang said, you know, try a couple of medicines. Okay. He, he did that. Now he's failing. He's still got electrical shocks. He's got no medical comorbidity. So what, uh, what a comorbidity is, an, another medical condition that would make it potentially hard um, to, um, to do a procedure. So if they've had heart attacks or cancers or you know, emphysema or, or, or on blood thinner, something where you know, it, it compounds the, the, the problems here. Um, so in this case, the MRI scan does show a vascular compression. Um, so... Um, uh, I'll start with Dr. Um, <laughs> Dr. Chan. I'm going to pick on you again because your 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 video box keeps looking at me. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah I, I think you know it's clear to me this patient is healthy. Uh, that and he has give his you know best effort. He tried it medications for two years uh, that really hasn't worked for him. Uh, so was positive MI evidence of vascular compression. And I think I will refer him to my, to my surgical colleague. I said that, you know, you should go ahead with the microvascular decompression surgery. Um, and, and I think that has the best chance uh, to really address the root cause of your conditions. Um, and also it does not have, you know, side effects, uh, including um, uh, numbness and such that, that typically associated with uh, interventions. Okay, uh, Dr. Palm. So, you mentioned the first case. Um, he, ha he hadn't really failed medical management, but this one looks like it has. So, um, um, if this patient came to you and said, um, "You know, am I a candidate for radio surgery at this point?" Um, would you consider offering this patient this option? Um, yeah, I mean, if he's talked about um, um, surgical decompression and. Um, you know, once to, once the non-invasive treatment alternative, I, I would talk to him about um, about radio surgery. Um, though I would counsel him that the recurrence rates um, for pain are probably a little bit higher. Okay. What what um, how if he has the radio surgery? How long typically um, do we need to wait to see some kind of benefit of the radiation? Is it like the next day, or is it a few weeks? Yeah. Before? Yeah, and that's a, another thing I also counsel. Um, oftentimes, it's not immediately. Um, it can be a month um, before uh, patients can have pain relief from the radiosurgical procedure. Okay, and then and then, um, what side effects could a patient have from radiosurgery? Yeah, so in terms of how radiation works, it targets the pain fibers. Um, basically, um, tries to kill the. Uh, the, those um, nerve fibers in the trigeminal nerve. And so um, kind of by the same mechanism in which it helps with the pain, it can also result in numbness from damaging the nerve. So that's probably the most common side effect of radiosurgery. And um, I'd say, you know, 30, 30 to 50% of patients will have some degree of numbness um, with the procedure. Okay. And, and how, how, in terms of the numbness, does that, how does that impact the patients? Does it? Yeah, many, I mean, many patients would prefer that to the pain. Um, so in, in most cases, um, it, um, it, it is preferable to the pain. Okay. And Dr. Zhang, um, what would you say at this point? Failed Tegretol and Gabapentin, is it worth trying some more medications? Um, I think it patient, depends. 
Yeah, yeah. But let's say the patient says, I, I still don't want surgery or, or, or radiation, but what would you do to this? How would you manage this patient? Yeah, it really depends on the patient. And if they want, they're, you know, reluctant to go the surgical route, I would say, you know, try oxcarbazepine or even try lamictal um, or add on some baclofen to see if it's helpful. If those options fail, I would definitely encourage the, strongly encourage the patient to see you, Dr. Chang. Okay. Um, so here's the same, same scenario, but I modified it a little bit. So failed two, two medications, still has electric shocks. This time the patient has significant medical comorbidities. They're, they're on blood thinners because they had a, several heart attacks and they have a cardiac stent in. Um, so they're on some, some blood thinners. Um, you know, a cardiologist says, no way can you stop those um, because you know, we're yeah. worried about the, the, the stent. Um, so how, how does this change um, the management? Uh, Dr. Zhang, you wanna start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think if, you know, we've gone the oxcarb route and all those uh, oral medicines are not helpful, then a couple other thoughts. One would be, I would refer to our wonderful colleague, Dr. Chien at the pain management clinic to see if there are any procedures that could be potentially helpful. Um, there are some studies showing that Botox could potentially be something to be tried. It's so hard for insurance to uh, actually cover that, but something to consider. And also there are some exciting clinical trials out there that are looking at CGRP antagonists um, to be used for trigeminal neuralgia. So things like remigipant and uh, irinimab are being looked at. So I think consideration of going into a clinical trial is something to think about. Okay, Dr. Chan, um, Thank uh, you for this, the patient your, your, this patient's now sitting in your clinic. Yeah, so <laughs> this patient looks like has classic trigeminal neuralgia with electric Correct. shocks uh, yes. and has significant comorbidities, uh, you know, uh, can't have a, a microvascular decompression surgery. I think this patient is perfect for, uh, re, uh, you know, uh, percutaneous interventions, including uh, radio frequency ablation or uh, radio uh, or rhizotomy with glycerol or balloon compressions. Uh, okay, and you... the data really showing that it has a really high significant, you know, high success rate uh, for first year is 90%. Uh, and then over five years is more than 70% success rate. Um, and, and and plus it, it works right away. Uh, so you don't need to wait. Uh, it's the same day procedures. Uh, it's really safe uh, for for the time you know for for the case itself. The downside is it it comes with uh, profound numbness, right? So oftentimes I do two steps. I would do this test block first and see whether you can actually can tolerate the numbness that come with it. Uh, and if you're okay with it, then I will proceed with the permanent rhizotomy procedures. Okay, really briefly, 30 seconds. Tell, tell the webinar um, attendees, how, what, how do you actually do the radio frequency rhizotomy? Okay, so basically you, um, you know, under some moderate sedation in the operating room under uh, fluoroscopic guidance, I'll put a small needles at the corner of the mouse, that needle will travel. Uh, and then until it go into the middle brain fossa, Sounds very scary, but uh, we do it in the sterile fashions. Uh, we do this on a routine basis. Once the needle is at the final target, uh, and then I'll give you a little bit more pain medicine. I'll deliver 80 degrees Celsius radio frequency energies to basically damage the nerve. And then hopefully the pain signals were no longer there. Okay, so Dr. Palm, um, the patient comes from Dr. Chen's clinic to your clinic. and. And the only thing he remembers out of Dr. Chen's clinic is all this talk about needles. And, and so um, doesn't, doesn't like that. Um, what, what are your thoughts here? And um, can, we, can we do some radio surgery? Yeah, I mean, given the significant medical co comorbidities, um, I think the non-invasive, completely non-invasive um, aspect of radio surgery um, would, um, you know, make, make, makes that treatment um, suitable for this patient. Um, it, it's um, also, you know, outpatient procedure, one session. Um, so that is um, definitely a treatment I would um, talk to the patient okay. about. And can you give us just a 30 second rundown of what, how, how radio surgery is done? Yeah, so it's um, basically two sessions. One is a planning session where um, we get our treatment planning scans and make a mask. And then um, it takes me and Dr. Chang. Um, it's it's always done with both a radiation oncologist and a neurosurgeon at Stanford. So um, Dr. Chang and I will um, 
you know, work on a plan and then the patient will come back. And um, it's usually um, a one hour session. The patient is um, in the treatment room. Um, the, uh, we use the CyberKnife radio surgical platform to deliver our uh, radio surgery. And so um, the machine um, kind of rotates all around the patient, delivers hundreds of um, pencil beam beams of radiation that intersect at a very small target precisely um, on the trigeminal nerve. Um, it's, you don't see the radiation, you don't feel it. It's a painless procedure, again, non-invasive. So um, particularly well-suited for patients who are trying to avoid um, surgery or any kind of invasive procedure. So, so no needles then, like Dr. Chen. <laughs> no needles, even okay. though it's called cyber knife. You know, okay. No cutting. And, and then um, you, you mentioned cyber knife. So if you could give us um, maybe just a short um, comparison of gamma knife versus cyber knife, um, because oftentimes patients hear about one or the other or both. Is, is there a big difference or do both achieve the same results in this case? Yeah, I always tell my patients there it's it's all the, it's all radio surgery. They're just different platforms. Um, at Stanford, we use CyberKnife because it was invented here, and we have the a longest and largest experience with um, using this um, platform. But um, they're just different ways to do radio surgery. Okay, great. Okay, case number four. Um, so. Um, same guy, he's this unlucky guy, he's 55 year old, keeps coming in, just different, different stories each time. Um, so failed two medications, um, has uh, um, still electrical shock, very classic trigeminalgia symptoms, no medical morbidities. And this time the MRI scan shows no vascular compression. Um, and before I ask the panelists, um, I, I, I know some people have been trying to raise their hands. Um, so what, what I'm going to do is we have a question and answer session at the end. So if you could um, submit your questions um, to me, um, there's already 12 in the pipeline, but if you submit the questions to me um, uh, after we get through these cases, there's, there's two more after this one, then we'll open up to the panelists for the question and answer session. Okay, so back to the panelists, no vascular compression. Um, so um, how does this change your management, if any, of, of how you would, you would do this? Um, so uh, Dr. Zhang, does this change what you do here? I think it would be pretty similar to what we talked about for the sort of previous scenario. Um, okay. You know, exhaust the oral treatments, send to Dr. Chan's office to see if there's any other procedures to be done. Um, and also, you know, this is someone I would still probably send to your office, Dr. Chang, to, you know, get a consultation, see if there's anything uh, surgical that you think would be helpful. Okay, Dr. Chan, um, so no vascular compression here. Um, are they still a candidate for radio frequency rhizotomy? Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. I think those, those are the group of patients that I think will benefit uh, in the most from interventions. That includes CyberKnife. Uh, and I completely agree, you know, for patients who are needophobic or have multi-branch uh, trigeminal neuralgia or people have severe comorbidities. And I think I oftentimes refer them to CyberKnife uh, myself. I think it's just a very neat uh, and then very comfortable uh, technique, you know, procedure for our patient. But uh, otherwise, yes, I think this patient will, um, will benefit. Uh, likelihood is very high uh, because he has electric shock type of pain uh, from percutaneous interventions, uh, you know, radio frequency rhizotomy, glycerol, again, balloon compressions, all of them uh, that we can, you know, offer to them, even though the radio frequency ablation uh, is the most common one that we're doing here at Stanford, uh, followed by glycerol. Uh, and I think this will be, you know, it, once we confirm again, uh, I agree with Dr. Zhang that to send to you for another MI, maybe Dr. Rintemar can take another look at it uh, with his excellent, you know, eye. Sometimes we can miss that. Uh, and then uh, once that's double, triple confirmed, there's no vascular compression, then uh, MVD is likely not the option. Uh, and then interventions, yes. Okay, um, Dr. Pollum, um, this candidate um, comes in and asking about radio surgery um, as an option. Co thoughts and comments? Yep, um, radio surgery would be a treatment option for this patient. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so here's uh, the next case. Um, 
85 year old patient now. So um, I started young and now we're getting up to 85. So, but, he, but he's super healthy. Um, and his MRI scan shows some vascular compression. Um, so um, Dr. Zong, um, how, how, you know, assuming this patient hasn't tried medications yet, um, and we start them on medications. How, how do you manage um, like the el more uh, elderly patients in terms of potential side effects from the medications? Is it, is it more common or, um, or it, does your management strategy differ uh, in older patients? So again, 85 year old, but super healthy. I'm glad you brought this up. In older patients, we see a lot more side effects with our standard medicines like oxcarbazepine and carbamazepine. They tend to have uh, more issues with ataxia or balance when they're walking. They're more sleepy. Um, it's very hard for a lot of our uh, older patients to function on these standard medicines. So often I will actually try lamotrigine. Um, they tend to have lesser uh, side effects with this, but with lamotrigine, you have to start slow and kind of titrate up uh, slowly as well. Uh, so that's where I would start with him. Dr. Chin. Um... How would you manage this 85 year old? Yeah, no, you, I, I agree. He's not afraid of needles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm considering the side effects concerns. Uh, and I mean, you know, with Dr. John, I feel at ease that we can start low, start slow. Uh, and this patient may get great benefits from just medical management. But for some reason, if you choose not, or there's too much side effects, uh, yes, then he, um, he is a candidate for interventions. Uh, but of course, he's also a candidate for you uh, for to be considered, right? Um, because you know, I know that if he can tolerate general anesthesia, uh, he would be a great candidate. He he would have very good outcome. Okay, uh, it really uh, depends on comorbidities. So, Dr. Palum, um, are you know older patients you know that are higher surgical risk? Are they good candidates for Cyberknife? Yeah, um, yeah. Again, um, for all of the. Um, reasons uh, I discussed previously in terms of it being a non-invasive treatment, they would be great candidates for radio surgery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, all, all the previous five cases I, I showed um, the panel, the patients had this, the classic electrical shock like pain. Um, so I wanted to change it up a little bit. So this is a middle-aged uh, patient he describes his pain as dull and achy. And it's, he says it's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He doesn't really have any components of electrical shock, um, uh, just dull, achy pain. And he states that he's had the pain for a couple of years now. It never started as electrical shocks. It's always been this kind of dull, achy pain. So uh, Dr. Chen, um, start with you. Yeah, uh, so my, mm -hmm. my experience was this type of, patient, a TN patient, the deal in dual achy pain with no electric shocks. And I think, you know, was the interaction with you for the many years, past many years, also looking into neurosurgery literatures, they don't do well with MVD. Um, and a lot of times neurosurgeons and more and more tend to not offer decompression surgeries for those patients anymore. Uh, I, I think there's just a lot of other things going on that we don't understand. There could be comorbidities uh, of, you know, psych psychological components to that. There could be other things, central sensitization process going on there, uh, et cetera. So I wouldn't offer uh, surgery, open surgery to go. Again, those are the patients who would be, uh, you know, great candidates for multidisciplinary management that our neurology colleague, as well as that clinic will offer. We combine, you know, pain management, uh, medical management, psychology counseling, coping together uh, to, to start with uh, and see whether we can make any difference for them. Um, just to add on, those patients remain a candidate for interventions, uh, you know, once if they do fail or if they don't do well with, with those conservative therapy, uh, the success rate is, is not as ideal, as, as good as for the one that was electric shock type pain, uh, but still fairly good, I would say. More than 50% of the chance they will get better with percutaneous interventions. Okay, Dr. Palm, um, what, what are your thoughts about whether or not we should try radio surgery for this patient. Yeah, there is some data that suggests similarly that um, these 
patients with atypical um, pain may not um, have as good pain relief outcomes with radiosurgery, but we also, um, there's also other data showing that, um, you know, um, many of these patients can benefit as um, from radiosurgery. So um, I, I think it's an option that we can consider. Um. So Dr. Zhang, um, what, what's your thoughts here? And so maybe does this change your medical management? Um, does it change the type of medicines you would try and, 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 and your expected outcomes? Right. So it's possible that this person has, you know, the pers- uh, trigeminal neuralgia with persistent pain. Um, I tend to really doubt a lot of the trigeminal neuralgia diagnoses that come through my clinic. We start from scratch with the history to make sure we're not actually missing out on a different entity um, and that it's not a misdiagnosis. A lot of the patients who come to our clinic with trigeminal neuralgia actually have something like a, like a different headache disorder or headache syndrome that has associated face pain with it. And what happens is when these patients go to their general practitioner or general neurologist, they focus their history on the face pain part of their syndrome, and they no one asks them about the head pain or other associated symptoms. So in our clinic, number one is to retake that history and make sure we're not missing anything else. Okay, great. Um, but in terms of, let's say, this does sound like it's no headache and just that the face pain, but it's not electrical shocks, would your choice of medicines be the same at the, at the start? What if we're suspecting TN? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, we got a, a fair number of questions. So I'm going to open up the questions. Um, and uh, uh, I'll I just want to ask, maybe I'll, I'll, as I read the, que- I'll read the questions and then I'll maybe um, if, um, ask a panelist or one or two of you to comment on it. So um, the first question is, is physical activity, can that, is that make trigeminal neuralgia worse? If they exercise, for example, does that make the pain worse? Um, Dr. Zhang, you want to comment on that? Do you see that? that yeah, uh, that's not a typical complaint we get. I think it's more like if there's contact with that area in some uh-huh. way, if there's motion associated with that area, that can cause more pain. Okay. Um, so um, the next question is... Um, if multiple medications and an MVD have failed, what comes next? Dr. Chen? Well, I, I want to, uh, and I think that one of the unique advantage of percutaneous intervention is that uh, you could have uh, a, you know, a test block uh, that to see whether intervention is appropriate for you. So, um, you know, when you fail MVD and then you fail medical management, you 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 kind of a uh, you know all the you rule out all other causes such as headache. It's confirmed as a TN, and I will offer a test block. You know, uh, if if a diagnostic test block with some local anesthetics confirm that indeed uh, they were able to abolish most of your pain, then I would offer uh, interventions, the permanent intervention as a next step. If let's say the diagnostic block is iffy or not working then I think we have to re, you know, go back to drug bot and think about something else. Something else is going on here, right? Okay, this is a specific question um, for Dr. Chen. Um, if the trigeminal neuralgia affects the eye and the upper part of the mouth, both of those areas, does a, does a rhizotomy possibly, can, can it harm the eye? No, so the eye is innovated by V1, the, uh, the V1 branch, uh, which innovates a sensation of cornea. So if we, um, if we do ablate the V1 subbranch, there is a, uh, it, it does not cause per se the damage to the eyeball or the uh, eyesight, but it does reduce your cornea sensations. So the cornea reflex is diminished. Uh, such that you know sometimes you come 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 with dry eyes, uh, and then a blunted response to like fallen bodies going to eyes. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, but it does not, you know, it it really it doesn't kind of uh, impact your visions or or other functions per se. Okay. Um, another question, Doctor uh, Zhang or Doctor Chen. Um, either of you um, 
um, had experience with vitamin B12, either by injection or sublingual for trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, not specifically. And I, uh, I don't think we have much evidence for that either. Okay, Dr. Chen, you want a vitamin B12 injections? Any experience with that? Sorry, I my my computer just ran a battery. I replugged in. No, I don't have that experience, unfortunately. Okay, question for Dr. Uh, Zhang: um, What types of complementary medicines might help treat trigeminal neuralgia? Yeah, I have sent some of my patients uh, to get acupuncture done. I, the evidence isn't great, but you know, for a lot of our patients, they have a lot of side effects on, um, you know, oral treatments that we use and, you know, they may not be a great surgical candidate or they're reluctant to go the surgical or procedural route. So they want to try something more kind of natural and with lesser side effects. So acupuncture is something to consider. Okay. Um, so question for probably all the panelists are, any of these procedures possible for people with um, MS tr induced trigeminal neuralgia, multiple sclerosis induced trigeminal neuralgia? Um, so that's typically something where we see a, an, an MS a lesion or plaque in the pons and it just happens to create an injury to the trigeminal nerve in the brainstem. Um, and some of these patients can, can get face pain. So um, Dr. Chien, I'll ask you, a comment for us on this? Yes, side. I definitely have treated uh, uh, quite a few MS patients come, you know, with TN uh, and uh, the interventions. Uh, I don't have the definitive data yet. That there are some reports and publications that uh, it's helpful. It's not as helpful as the, you know, the TN, uh, trigeminal neurology, but uh, people with MS could be uh, the main to be a candidate. Uh, like I said before, uh, was our you know, approach, uh, we always do two steps. We offer you the test block first to see whether it's working or not. Uh, and then we will proceed with a permanent if the test block does work. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, I've, I've done microvascular decompressions on patients with MS induced trigeminal neuralgia. And the, the theory is that um, there's a blood vessel touching the nerve, but it's not sufficient enough to cause pain alone. But then when they get a second injury, to the nerve um, at the nucleus, for example, then the nerve has been hit twice. Um, and it's kind of the two hit theory. One hit wasn't sufficient enough to cause trigeminal neuralgia, but when the nerve gets hit twice, then it does. And so if you decompress the blood vessel off the nerve, you, you, you reduce it from two sites of injury to one. And um, a lot of times the patients still get, get better. Um, so maybe this is a question for Dr. Zhang and Dr. Chen, are there any medications for trigeminal neuralgia in the pipeline and how long does it usually take for them to become available? Uh, yeah, so like earlier we were talking about the CGRP, um, uh, both the monoclonal antibodies as well as small molecule uh, treatments. CGRP is basically a pain molecule that mm -hmm. we see in migraine pathophysiology and uh, we also see elevated levels of it in people with trigeminal neuralgia, and that's why you know people, people are investigating whether or not this could be helpful. Uh, the clinical trials are in process, and um, you know these medicines have been FDA approved for migraine treatment already. So, you know, hopefully the trials go well, and we can see these come out soon for trigeminal neuralgia. Okay. Um... Dr. Pollum, what is the percentage of anesthesia dolorosa after radio surgery? So maybe for that question, um, maybe comment on the, what the definition of anesthesia dolorosa is, and then give your experience with the percentage of, uh, of that occurring. Yeah, so um, this is um, pretty much um, um, an, um, a very dense pain um, and um, along the distribution of the um, trigeminal nerve that patients can have after um, after these uh, uh, local therapies, and it can uh, uh, many patients can say it's worse than the pain of the trigeminal neuralgia itself. Um, I would say the risk of this is dependent on the um, radiation technique in terms of dose. Um, dose used and dose to um, brainstem um, volume of the nerve. So a, a lot of this dependent on the technique. Um, in our experience, it's not common, probably less than 5%. Okay. 
Um, what's, um, for any of the panelists that want to take this one, we, we talked about how sometimes the pain can spontaneously resolve um, in these patients, um, and sometimes for a period, long periods of time. So what, what's the thought process be, be, behind why that happens? Like, is there a mechanism of action, Dr. Zhang? Um, often, you know, we think of the nerve as being hypersensitive. So for whatever reason, the hypersensitivity calms down over a period of time, but it can reignite. I once had a patient who saw me at age 93 with TN. And the interesting part of the story was that she had TN when she was in her forties. She took carbamazepine for a year. Things mm -hmm. calmed down. She actually weaned off of the carbamazepine, didn't have any face pain for 50 years. And it came back when she was 93. So it's a very unpredictable disease, but, and it can sort of come and go. Okay. There's a question. Maybe I'll answer this one. If you get complete relief from a microvascular decompression, but it lasts only two years and the pain um, comes back, what options should a person consider? Um, it's been three years since the surgery. Is there a history of success with subsequent decompression or is that even recommended? So generally, if a patient's had a microvascular decompression and, and it works for a period of time and the pain comes back, I usually go back to the beginning and start with a new MRI scan um, to see, um, we're looking for a couple of things. Um, um, you know, can we see those little cushions that were in place? Um, are there any blood vessels still touching the nerve? Um, um, or is there anything changed? I, I have seen patients that have had microvascular decompressions and in which the surgeon, you know, they, they, they put a cushion in there blocking off the largest blood vessel and maybe they assumed the smaller blood vessels weren't a problem. Um, but later on, those smaller blood vessels did become, become a problem. So I think I start with a new MRI scan. Um, and if, um, if patients have failed microvascular decompression, they're, you're often a candidate for radiosurgery. And an MRI scan in, is necessary to identify the nerve to deliver the radiation. So an MRI scan would tell you whether there's any any um, consideration toward a second microvascular decompression and an MRI scan would be necessary if you're considering the radiosurgery. So um, starting with the MRI scan is probably the next step there. Um, so um, uh, let's see, um, comments maybe to um, Dr. Chen and Dr. Zhang, um, thoughts on using nortriptyline, Dr. Chen? Uh, yeah, I, I think norcipline, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's not the top line for TN, uh, but for people who may have, co you know, cochlear depressions or sleep issues uh, that we can, we can give norcipline to them. Uh, that helps for both pain and mood as well as help for sleep. Um, and it's once per day dosing um, and people like that, but it's not the first line treatment. Yeah, okay. I totally agree. Uh, the evidence is poor. It's typically not that effective. We use it more as an adjunctive therapy if there's other issues going on. Okay, next question. Um, uh, can trigeminal neuralgia be caused by cervical spine muscle irritation um, or is it always the nerve in the face? Dr. Chan? Um, I think that's a that's a good question to have. Uh, obviously, you know, cervical muscles uh, that uh, or joints could C1, C2 could affect uh, occipital nerves, um, and they kind of intact with trigeminal nerve in a way. In the top of head and forehead, they can talk to each other. Uh, you know, what, in the medically, what causes hypersensitization phenomenon? Um, that it's possible that your trigeminal nerves are already kind of a, you know, like you said, partially injured the lesion by a vascular touching on it uh, and they can amplify each other. But I'm not aware of a direct cause of result relationship uh, yet. Maybe there's some indirect interaction. That's all I can say. Okay. Let me ask you, Dr. Chen, this, this question. Thoughts on cryotherapy down the nasal cavity, which helped for nine months, but then the pain came back. Is that a standard treatment? And is that trigeminal neuralgia? I, I don't think this is a, a standard care. Uh, it's most likely uh, the cryotherapy through the nose is to ablate the post, uh, a post uh, foramen sphenopalatine ganglion neurons, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, SPG per se, uh, that 
had received the uh, input from V2, the maxillary branch from trigeminal nerve. So by ablating the intranasal uh, SPG fibers, uh, maybe that could help downregulate the trigeminal nerve activities, but it's not a standard of care. Um, okay. It's a case report. Dr. Pollum, could somebody with atypical trigeminal neuralgia get worse pain after, after CyberKnife? Um, I mean, I, I guess if they developed a, like what we were talking about, the um, anesthesia dolorosa or um, numbness that's bothersome. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chan, what about um, someone with atypical trigeminal neuralgia? Can they get worse pain after a radiofrequency ablation? It is absolutely possible um, that because the, the heat treatment, you know, uh, could cause immediate neuritis uh, and the neuritis could really fill up the pain and cause more pain following the procedure. That, that is definitely possible. Okay. Um, so I mean, this is also for Dr. Chen. Um, so um, uh, any, any comments on using nerve stimulators in the face to, to treat trigeminal neuralgia? That's an excellent question. Uh, it is one of my research focuses as well, uh, that, you know, that all the peripheral nerve stimulators uh, being approved so far uh, are targeting uh, peripheral nerves below the head and neck. There's no approved uh, devices for head and neck, you know, nerve condition, except more recently, about four weeks ago, uh, we got a peripheral nerve stimulators um, treatment approved for greater occipital nerves. Uh, and I uh, learned that some of the big companies, uh, Medtronic, Abbott Laboratory, they're uh, working on an uh, implantable uh, device for um, head and neck nerve condition, including TN in the future. Um, but right now we have some off-label use. Uh, there are definitely some neurosurgeons uh, and pain doctors that are implanting the conventional spinal cord stimulators uh, into the trigeminal nucleus uh, through the face. Um, and I think it's a very high risk procedures uh, with you know, unpredictable outcome. Uh, right now, I'm not ad advocating for those procedures, but yes, there are people uh, and doctors out there, and they're offering those to some of our patients. Okay, it's, it's a it's a it's a field uh, in the uh, in a lot of development right now. Okay, so an another um, question. I'll I'll maybe start with this one. So, um, while non-surgical options may relieve the pain, they don't eliminate the cause, doesn't it? Just continue to get worse in this case. So it, it's true that a microvascular decompression, we like to say, deals with the root cause of the problem. But in order to do that, you have to have a surgery. So, um, you know, the, some of these other options allow a less invasive procedure. So essentially it's a choice. Um, do you wanna deal with the root cause of the problem and, and have a microvascular decompression? Or um, do you wanna go with a less invasive option, but you know, uh, that would potentially leave the blood vessel uh, on the nerve. Um, any, um, any comments um, from the panelists of whether specific diet um, is, is useful in kind of pain management, um, Dr. Chen, um, any dietary changes that, that would help? And I, I think ha having a healthy diet is good for a lot of things. Um, and, uh, you know, but in particular, I think for anyone who has neuropathic pain, we, um, recommend our patient to increase their intake of, uh, uh, you know, omega-3, um, alpha lipoid acids, uh, and vitamin C, and et cetera. So many more fruits uh, and fresh vegetables, et cetera, but nothing specific. I think it just in general, I hope they will eat more of healthy diet. Um, that's about it. Okay, Dr. Zhang, um, have there been studies on long-term side effects of taking gabapentin or oxcarbazepine? I am not familiar with that. For a lot of our patients, you know, they've been taking these for a long time and overall they're, you know, pretty safe. You do for oxcarbazepine, you do want to make sure you're monitoring, um, you know, the chemistry panels, looking at sodium, looking at your blood counts and uh, liver enzyme function. Okay. 
Um, Dr. Pollum, after a trigeminal nerve has been radiated, if the electrical shock pains return, how many times can radiation be prescribed? Yeah, we've certainly um, repeated uh, radio surgery for patients who've had prior radio surgery. Um, it's probably most effective for patients who've had good pain relief um, with their initial course of radio surgery. Um, but yeah, prior radio surgery doesn't preclude having this treatment again in the future should the pain recur and the patient need it. Okay, and this, the same um, um, attendee asked, can an MBD be prescribed? And so the answer is yes, um, as long as the MRI scan shows uh, vascular compression, you can consider an MBD after um, radio surgery. Um, okay, um, so, so I guess uh, this is an interesting question. Um, patients that have both electrical shock pain as well as achy pain, so let's say you got 50, 50, 50% 50 of your pain is electrical shocks that come and go and 50% of the pain is dull achy pain. Um, does that change uh, our management? So Dr. Palm, if the patient comes to you um, with this type of thing, what are your general thoughts um, in terms of, of radiation? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would, um, I, I think they could benefit, you know, if, if they've, we would kind of go through all of the different options in terms of medications, um, surgery, if it's applicable to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chen. Um, I think this, you know, yeah. Was it you? Pain, sharp pain. Yeah. I think it's not uncommon. Actually, most of the patients we see in the clinic are uh, those patients that, you know, they, they have electroshock type pain mixed with constant achiness. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, according to the new uh, ICHD, I mean, not that new now, uh, the 2013 one, and those are the patients that belong to the uh, classic trigeminal neuralgia subtype 2, uh, that they have triggered intermittent electroshock type pain combined with co-commentant co uh, co uh, achy persistent pain. Um, and I think there are still belonging to the classic TN. So I follow the same, um, uh, you know, uh, flow. Um, if they have vessel compression, then MVD, if there's no contraindications. Um, and of course, medical management first. Um, and, you know, both cyber knife and uh, intervention could be offered if they fail medical management, if they do not want to go forward with uh, open craniotomy surgery. Okay. Um, so there's another question. Um, I think uh, the general gist of this question is, um, you know, how often do we see, um, I'll start with Dr. Zhang, um, how often do you see um, a patient with, but it sounds like classic trigeminal neuralgia and you send them for the MRI scan and it doesn't show any vascular compression or any abnormality. Is that fairly common? Is that rare? Um, does that change how you initially manage the patient? It actually is quite common um, to not have any findings. Um, and you know, the change is that we, we don't readily, you know, send to neurosurgery for a consultation and we're going to really hone in on medical management of symptoms for the patient. Okay. Um, here's another question. 72-year-old um, -old patient with a non-cancerous tumor, so a benign tumor, pushing on the trigeminal nerve. Um, oxcarbazepine is causing low blood sodium, which is a side effect Dr. Zhang mentioned. Um, if no other comorbidities, can a microvascular decompression be considered? Um, so this is a little bit of a more complex scenario because it's not just a blood vessel pushing on the nerve, it's a, it's a tumor involved there. Um, and that can cause trigeminal neuralgia two different ways. It can cause trigeminal neuralgia by the tumor directly pushing on, on the nerve itself. Um, so direct tumor compression on the nerve. Um, but a fairly common scenario, I would say at least 50% of the time, what the tumor does is the tumor takes a blood vessel, an artery that's maybe not really putting pressure on the nerve and the tumor as it grows, pushes the blood vessel into the nerve. Um, so you, you can often find a, a situation where um, you have that kind of combination tumor and the blood vessel. And in this case, um, if there's no other comorbidities, you can consider a microvascular decompression, but it's, it's more than just a straightforward microvascular decompression. It would be a resection of the tumor and, and then 
decompressing the blood vessel off of the nerve. So essentially doing, doing both, both things. Um, uh, let's see. Um, would you do an MVD on a M multiple sclerosis patient who has a lesion on the trigeminal nerve, um, but there doesn't appear to be a blood vessel pressing on the nerve? Um, so that's a little bit more challenging. I'm not sure what, what it means by a lesion. If there's no blood vessel, um, you, you, you would not do a, just a regular MVD. Um, if, if by lesion, you mean a, a, you know, a tumor or some sort of mass, then it's kind of what we just talked about. It, it would be a scenario where if the pain's bad enough and you failed other medical management and or other less invasive procedures, you can certainly consider an MVD um, to, to resect this, this lesion. Um, Dr. Chen, what about ketamine? Yeah, so that is a wonderful question. So there's, you know, the literature does not uh, uh, strong is not strong enough to to conclude uh, one or another. Um, but ketamine infusion has been very effective for many chronic pain conditions, such as complex regional pain syndrome, centralized pain, post stroke pain, etc. So over the past uh, five, 10 years or so, we have been offering ketamine infusions for um, head and neck pain patients. Uh, for the past two years, I have uh, personally done a retrospective analysis. Uh, I, uh, I draw over 200 admissions. Uh, I was able to identify about 20 patients who came in uh, for ketamine infusions uh, for, you know, um, due to uh, refractory trigeminal neuralgia or neuropathy. Uh, so the initial data review showing the ketamine infusion for five days work for about one fourth of the patient that could have pain relief for more than one month or longer. The other 50%, very helpful, but they don't last beyond one month. The last one quarter, a quarter of them, they don't work at all. So when you look into the detailed characteristics, the one that, that on one quarter patient, 25% of patients don't work, are the one that has have atypical facial pain, meaning that their pain is just everywhere, not following the dermatin distribution. The one that had the best benefit, the one that has more than a month and longer, are the one that have you know TN, typically TN, uh, and of course those are the patient who have exhausted everything, right? They they've tried MVD, medical management interventions, and etc. Uh, this is kind of last resort. Uh, and we have found some good hope, but the sample size, keep in mind, is very small, right? We only have about 20 patients up until last month. So it's not a strong enough. More randomized control studies from multi multiple centers will be needed uh, to conclude whether the ketamine infusion, you know, is a viable option for our TN patients in the future. Okay, great. So a couple of people asked about uh, Chiari malformation and uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So a Chiari malformation is a situation in which um, part of the cerebellum, the brain in the back of the neck, um, kind of sticks down into the spinal canal. Um, and so that's a completely separate problem than trigeminal neuralgia. They, they should not be related, but it doesn't mean that they can't happen in the same patient. So um, for something like that, um, if I had a patient with both trigeminal neuralgia and Chiari malformation, I'd be kind of working them up as separate, separate issues. Um, okay, um, I can't remember if um, Dr. Zhang or Dr. Chin, um, either you talked about Vimpat as an appropriate medication to try. I don't I think not. we've talked about that. Yeah, we rarely use that one, actually. Um, I think the evidence is poor as well. Okay. I agree. Okay. Um, so uh, let me see. Uh, we, um, so um, uh, Dr. Pollum, um, uh, gamma knife stopped shocks, but created a dull achy pain. And then later on the shocks came back, um, you know, consideration of next options. Yeah, I think as, as we discussed, if um, they had initial good pain relief with um, their first course of radiosurgery, um, uh, you know, repeat radiosurgery is an option. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, maybe this uh, question is for Dr. Zhang. Um, so we t um, you mentioned a couple of times in your answers about low sodiums as side effects of 
medications. Um, how common is that and how big of a medical issue is that to get addressed? Yeah, when we see it, it's often in older patients. Um, it has to be addressed very quickly. Um, one of the dangerous things that can happen with low sodium levels is seizure. So you definitely don't want, we don't want our patients seizing. Okay. Um, and uh, um, I know there was, um, I think Dr. Zhang, you mentioned um, Botox um, as well. Um, what's the, the current data on that? And when do, then when do we consider it in terms of the you know, order of, of trying options? Yeah, it's a good question. I think there was a, like a meta-analysis a couple of years back that looked at four uh, randomized controlled trials. Um, I think the dosing was like 25 units to 100 units. Um, I think ma the majority of patients actually responded very well with like greater than 50% reduction in their pain, which is terrific compared to placebo. One of the issues with Botox and these studies is that the protocol varies uh, amongst these studies and um, the dosing also varies. So there's no standardized protocol or dosing right now. Okay, great. Um, so we're, we're getting short on time and I, I did um, you know, want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, we tried to answer as many of the questions as um, I could, but we had over 80 questions come in. So, um, so um, the, the, for those of you that didn't get your questions um, answered, um, again, here's the uh, phone number for the, the Facial Pain Association. Um, um, they have, um, you know, they're here to help any, anybody with facial pain and trigeminal neuralgia. So I encourage you to, to call them, contact them. They can provide some support. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any questions related to either microvascular decompression um, options or, or uh, radio surgery options with the CyberKnife. Um, uh, and we have a, we have a, um, co a comprehensive facial pain program here at Stanford. Um, so uh, again, it, it, if, you know, we, we look at everybody individually, there's no kind of cookie cutter formula here. We're trying to come up with the best option to improve your quality of life. Um, um, so um, happy, happy to help anybody that, that um, you know, is, is a patient in our facial pain program. Um, I do want to, again, remind everybody on uh, January 29th and January 30th, the, the Facial Pain Association is having their um, um, annual uh, virtual meeting. It's, um, it's a very informative meeting. It's over uh, two days um, with about 30 different speakers um, speaking on all the various different aspects of managing uh, facial pain. Um, so I'd encourage everybody to um, sign up and attend that. And the information for that can be found on the uh, Facial Pain Association uh, website. Um, so I did uh, want to um, uh, thank, again, our, our, our panelists for taking time out of their, their evening to do this. I know I've kind of kept you here for, for an hour and a half, but I think uh, I certainly appreciated all your, your efforts and participation. I think the, the panelists did as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Palm, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Chen, and Dr. Wintermark um, for you know, your, your wonderful generosity with your, your time this evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Very much. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.